So I did a, another video on uh, John Taylor Gatto on his uh, book, The Underground History of American Education. And I referenced this 14 principles. So these are the 14 principles of elite private schools. He studied how education works at these elite private schools in the United States and other countries. And uh, there's a history of US presidents and other just people in the upper crust of society getting a different type of education than middle class and lower class people. And so he went out and modeled that and then showed how you could inculcate that uh, for people who were doing homeschooling. And so this guy down in the comments summarized these 14 points. So I'm gonna go through these and uh, just read out each one and then give you my uh, opinion on each uh, and my sort of commentary and analysis on each of these. So the first one is a theory of human nature. And he talks about these five areas, five ways of learning about human nature, five subject areas. So history, and, and you can, I'll put a link down to this video where he explains this in a little bit more depth in this video. Um, he's done a bunch of video, like, this is part of like a two or three hour program that he did, and you can check that out as well. Um, but he talks about how there's history, philosophy, theology, literature, and law. And all of these help explain and give you different perspectives on human nature. And this is actually a lot. I, I find that the different theories of psychology, I was, I, I was actually really surprised that he didn't mention psychology. And I actually see psychology as a form of theology. And uh, I'm going to be doing a course on that in philosophy as well. These are different um, they're different total systems. And so, uh, I'm going to have a course on that at some point and you can check out some of my religious and philosophy videos, um, where I talk about that. But I was surprised you didn't have psychology here because one of the, and, and politics as well, political science, because political science, uh, and sort of engineering civilizations or, or engineering societies they rest on their fundamental principles on human nature. And so psychology and political science both should have been included here. And in some sense, I think, uh, I would probably put that above law and history because they're more to the point. Um, so I disagree a bit somewhat with that, but I agree with the overall idea of and I don't know that you necessarily are going to have one unified theory of human nature. Um, a lot of people in psychology have been trying to work on this problem. And I'm going to be having, I have a course in the pipeline on personality, and which is kind of like different theories of human nature, um, modeling personality and modeling. It's kind of a specialization of how to model role models. Um, you need to have a theory of human nature to do that. And even just for communication, you need to have a theory of mind to communicate with somebody. And uh, Baron Cohen, I forget his first name, but he's the brother of Sasha Baron Cohen, the actor and comedian. Um, he's an expert in autism, and he has a whole theory of autism that's based on theory of mind. Theory of mind is also big in AI, creating conversational AI. Um, natural language understanding, natural language uh, generation. So yeah, it's, I think it's more about having multiple theory, understanding all the different theories of human nature at a intellectual level of like, what is each theory? But then you also have stuff like history and literature where you see actual examples that's part of why people like Shakespeare so much, because it seemed to capture so much of human nature. And then law is kind of like, how do you implement this stuff into, and theology to an extent as well, because theology contain, can contain the laws of a certain religion. It kind of, there's crossover there, um, religious law. Uh, actually, I kind of talk about this in the Library of Congress video, uh, the two-hour tour of the Library of Congress. 
classification system. You can check that out if you want. Um, you can check out the classification of the legal category, which is the letter K, and it's pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, I think you really want to know all the different theories of human nature. And then you kind of apply the one that makes the most sense in the situation. And then you have case-based reasoning, which is your understanding of history, your understanding of literature. That gives you kind of the nonfiction and the fiction components. And you think about what's the most relevant uh, cases to the situation. And then you apply, you know, what worked in that situation or what didn't work in that situation, you apply it to this one. Skills, skill in the act of literacy, so writing and public speaking. This is basically rhetoric, um, classical rhetoric, classical communication skills, um, not even classical. He talks in other places about rhetoric, so that's kind of why I'm bringing that up. Uh, I have a course in the pipeline as well on communication. Uh, I have one or two kind of lower tier courses already on mastering the 12 fundamentals of communication skills. So check that out if you want kind of a, a starting point. Um, but yeah, basically writing, and you could even call it public writing. You know, speaking doesn't necessarily have to be public. You know, I'm speaking to you right now, but I'm just here by myself imagining you. And when you're on a Zoom call, you know, you're, you're kind of by yourself, you're kind of with other people, it's mediated communication. But even just talking to one other person, there's still a lot of skill involved in that. So focusing too much on public speaking can be a mistake as well. Um, and writing and, and, and public speaking as well, like it's one format, it's one uh, domain, but you really need to be skilled at like, you know, when you're, when you got your first cell phone, you were figuring out like, how do I text? Or like, what do I say on Twitter? Or when I'm DMing somebody, how do I do that? Or if I'm cold emailing somebody, what do I say? How do I language it? What works? What are the norms? You really need to be skilled in all the different sets of norms for all the different situations you're gonna be writing or speaking in or communicating in. And that also includes stuff like body language. Number three, Major institutional forms. So this is big, and he talked about, it, it's not just the forms, it's what do you do with them? So part of being in the upper class is about, you're gonna be in a leadership role where you're gonna be making changes and interventions into each, uh, into all the different um, areas. And so you need to understand all these different areas of government, all these different areas, uh, where government regulation has a has a uh, impact. So this is again part of classical education. You know, going back to Greek and Roman education, where upper class children were learning and preparing to be politicians, and so they were going to pass laws, and so they had to have something to say, and they had to have a theory of of society and of the major institutions so that they could pass laws and understand what's going on and what needs to be changed and how to change it and how it all works. So, and even, you know, if you become a senator or if you become a house rep in the US, you'll be given a tour. They, they give tours of, of these different things, especially courts and the military. Um, you're given a tour of these different institutions to give you kind of an inside perspective and so when you're making laws related to these institutions, you kind of at least have a minimum understanding of what's going on and how they work. So there's a there's a definite class component in this where because you're preparing yourself for a leadership role, you're trying to understand this stuff. So number four, oh, but there's another aspect to it as well, which is getting access to different institutions. So how to interact with different institutions. And what is, how do different people behave, but also how do you get access to people? How do you get access to somebody who's the CEO of a company or the mayor of a city? And he talks about that. He goes into detail on how he helped his like high school or middle school kids just, you know, get an interview 
or get access to like a mayor of a major city or the governor of a state or the anchor person of a TV show, of a news show. So understanding the pathways of how do you interact with other people that are in these institutions that have power and understanding the levers of power within the institutions and who are the people within those that control those levers of power and then how do you interact with them and get them to do what you want them to do. Number four, repeated exercises in the form of good manners and politeness. So this is basically socialization and there's a, uh, this is, I'm going to be talking about this in the uh, think like a king, think like a queen, because this is a significant component and in some ways is even bigger in uh, education of princesses and queens. Um, it's relevant to both, but there's even more of an emphasis on this uh, in historical female education. And uh, it's very important. You know, every class and every society has their own norms, and that's what defines good manners and politeness. And so it's really about, and, and uh, something that I'll probably talk about in that course is, is uh, major schools like Harvard, MIT have, MIT has a charm school, or they did. I think they may have gotten rid of it. Um, Harvard has something similar. They don't necessarily talk about it a lot publicly, but a lot of, um, upper class schools and colleges and universities have these kind of things that induct, induct people and socialize people uh, into, and, and engineering schools tend to put more emphasis on this because the engineers and math and science types, STEM types tend to have uh, worse social skills. Um, but developing these kind of things is very important. And he talks about future relationships, future alliances, et cetera, et cetera. Number five is independent work. So learning how to work independently, have your own motivation, uh, not be reliant on other people, um, think independently. So he emphasizes that. I think there's, you know, to take this to the next level where you really get into, um, royal education and sort of business executive succession or family businesses where a father is passing down or a mother is passing down to a son or daughter. Uh, that's where you get into even a higher level that isn't talked about here, which is teaching a child from a young age how to be in a management or leadership position and lead a group, not just be part of a group where everybody's equal, but be a manager, be a leader, act in an executive role. Um, and this is part of, uh, this is part of the training in, for example, officer schools in the military. So that's, that's particularly emphasized as well as business schools, because business schools in large part are about training the future, um, managers. And there's a crossover there's similarities between business schools and officer military officer schools and uh, the u.s military will send officers for example after they complete their initial training they'll send officers to harvard business school and other business schools to uh further their management training and there's kind of two tracks within officer uh military leadership there's kind of the military aspect of management which is actually the min minority and ma the majority of the uh, the upranking is actually through the kind of support aspects of the military and, and the, uh, the administration side of it, not the in the field sort of military combat roles. So, so that's why they would be going to a business school and that's why they would get value out of that. Um, Number six, energetic physical sports are not a luxury or a way of blowing off steam. They're a way to confer grace on the human presence. And grace translates into power and money later on. Teach you to practice handling pain and in, in dealing with emergencies. So there's kind of two different angles to this. Part of it is the grace aspect, which is 
goes beyond just politeness and manners and to a certain extent is the more masculine side of the history of uh, this kind of socialization. And it wasn't until fairly recently that women were participating in sports in a major way, in the way that uh, boys and men have throughout history. So um, there's, and there were alternative ways that women learned grace. So um, going back, th this this word has multiple meanings and you can trace it back historically. historically. And so these courses that I'm working on, think like a king, think like a queen, and kind of the education of kings and queens, princes, princesses, um, they are gendered paths. They, they are different in a lot of ways. And it's important to understand um, how each of those was achieved and the, the commonalities and differences. So uh, a key aspect of sports is also that sports historically and still in the present day are, have been used to prepare uh, children for the military and really men, boys to be in the military uh, when they're, they become men. So part of the grace goes into that as well. And uh, it's only fairly recently where women's sports have had, you know, funding and, um, you know, that's mostly the past 50 to 100 years. So uh, handling pain, dealing with emergencies, these are kind of code words for these prepare you for military situations where these kind of things are going to come up in major ways and teamwork associated with kind of a militaristic, uh, you know, studying the Olympics, a lot of the original Olympic sports are, you know, the discus throwing the javelin, that's like literally a military weapon, um, wrestling. So these are, you know, very obvious, uh, the marathon. So the original marathon was, uh, a messenger. I f I'm blanking out the exact details, but so basically a messenger who saw the enemy coming and had to run 26 miles uh, to the nearest city to or to alert the the leaders of the the country, um, and so it was literally somebody giving early warning of a military invasion. So it was a military exercise. Uh, so that's where a lot of the Olympics come from. Football, especially American football, is is kind of similar to the to squad level tactics in the military so um and the quarterback is kind of the the leader of that so um there's some similarities there and uh and so yeah the sports has that and building muscle and building you know moving your body and getting comfortable with your body and using your body uh, in sports then transfers that grace over. But that's a certain kind of grace. That's a certain kind of movement. And uh, there's a gendered component to that. Number seven, um, a complete theory of access to any place and any person. So this kind of goes, combines with uh, this one right here of the major institutions. And I think calling it a theory is a little much but it is sort of he gets more into detail in this video and other videos of how he does this and it's basically his point is there's always a quid pro quo it's all for anybody who's hard to reach you need to have some kind of reason some kind of uh benefit that they're going to get and so you have to be creative about that and uh, i am going to be doing a course at some point on cold calling and uh cold emailing and uh I used to have a course on mentorship that isn't, I'm not selling anymore where I talked about this to some extent of like, why would anybody ever mentor you? How does that work? What are the incentives there? Um, but basically you have to have some way of giving that person value. And so uh, that's what he means by a complete theory of access. It's, how do you get direct contact to somebody? It can be as simple as getting their personal phone number, their personal email, as opposed to their company email. Uh, how do you, or visiting them in person or giving a letter to their secretary or getting past gatekeepers, 
you know, a lot of this stuff is actually entrepreneurship and kind of sales stuff as well, or, uh, you know, even lobbying, political lobbying. Um, but basically, what are the techniques and strategies to get access to anybody? B2B sales is kind of similar to this, where you're trying to get around gatekeepers, get to decision makers, figure out who the decision makers are. Um, number eight, responsibility is essential. Always grab responsibility and always deliver more than asked for. So this one's a little bit, I didn't know exactly what to make of this. Um, it's kind of like a way to a path towards leadership is first take responsibility and then do a good job. And then you'll be given official recognition of that. And it's a way to sort of advance your career. Um, and there's almost kind of a citizenship aspect of it as well of being a good citizen, taking responsibility. There's an individualistic, you know, this is where I, I talked in the other video about John's sort of libertarian streak and libertarian ideology. And so responsibility is kind of a code word for that because it implies agency as opposed to structure. And that's a key theoretical distinction in psychology, sociology, political science, philosophy. How much of your life is about you making decisions and having free will and doing stuff? And how much of life is about luck and the things that you're born into and the structures that surround you and the privileges that you have and all that. So responsibility airs towards the side of more of an individualistic, agentic point of view. And that relates also to independent work. And you also notice handling pain, dealing with emergencies he doesn't mention teamwork here. So I don't know if he maybe mentions that in the uh, video, but in other interviews or videos, he's mentioned like Harvard admissions tends to look for people who perform well in individualistic sports, not team sports. And if it would be a team sport, they might look more towards a leadership position. So they might look at a quarterback, they might look at a um, point guard of a basketball team, for example. I talked about that somewhat in my modeling report of Caitlin uh, Clark. So you might want to check that out. She's a point guard, number one uh, college basketball player. Kind of like a female Steph Curry in college. Um, so number nine, arrival at a personal code of standards. Again, so th so there's kind of a, this idea of you're just coming up with your own code, kind of an existentialist uh, point of view, which has sort of some overlap with libertarian. I, I, don't, I don't know exactly how to describe it, but like in somebody with a different point of view might say, you're going to sort of adopt your culture's code of standard and there's one code of standards and you're just... And there's sort of an objective truth of that. So, um, but yeah, just, you know, this is part of leadership as well, where you're in a position of leadership, you're setting the rules, you're setting the tone, you're setting the culture. And so how are you going to inculcate that in your team and the people under you if you don't have that for yourself and you haven't thought about the sort of philosophy of how you're going to set up the rules and, and what's underpinning it? So how are you going to sort of provide that governance? Familiar with the fine arts, cultural capital. Uh, he also mentions how, except for religion, this is the only way to have a sort of transcendent experience and understand the transcendent aspect of being a human. So um, I think he's a Christian. I forget. I th I'm pretty sure that's in his Wikipedia, but... Uh, he mentions the various fine arts and how it's important to be cultured and sort of familiar with that. And that goes to sort of a well-rounded Renaissance man type uh, humanist classical education and the value of fine arts. Power of accurate observation and recording. 
for example, being able to draw accurately. So this one, I don't know if I fully agree with this. Um, historically, I think this was somewhat true. Um, I've spent some time learning drawing and learning, you know, how to do this. And I don't get the sense that there's a huge uh, benefit to doing this. I think with photography, with, with having cameras in your phone and just being able to record anything you need to, there, I, I'm not convinced that it really sharpens your perception that much. So uh, I think... I think it's still useful to be able to do some basic level of drawing and sketching, but um, but at, more in terms of drawing diagrams, flowcharts, mind maps, stuff like that to be able to, you know, if you're with a bunch of people and you're trying to draw some, communicate an idea on a whiteboard, that kind of stuff, I think that's valuable. But going beyond that, I'm not convinced being a, a great, spending any significant amount of time learning how to draw or paint or stuff like that gives you some special power of observation or, or really gives you any significant useful advantage that that generalizes so i don't i don't really agree with that uh number 12 ability to deal with challenges of all sorts so i think this is just about dealing with real world problems, getting experience, dealing with different challenges and not having everything just figured out for you in advance, having to problem solve, having to manage projects, having to go out in the world and actually do stuff and, and have contact with actual reality. That's part of what's special about entrepreneurship. And even if you don't want to be an entrepreneur, but you want to have something on the side, that's part of what's special about it is that if you're not in entrepreneurship and, and especially if you're not in something that's that competitive or, or isn't, doesn't require a lot of creativity, you can go through your whole life, not really being challenged that much or, or having to deal with that much uncertainty. And so by learning how to start a business or starting a side business or really trying to be innovative or being an entrepreneur within a company, or just trying to be creative or, or start, get something done that's new, that's out of the ordinary. And kind of, have, I have a pretty expansive view of, of entrepreneurship. I don't think it's just starting your own business. Um, but getting things done and taking on challenges and stuff that isn't, isn't all paint by numbers and somebody else figured it out and you're just kind of going through it yourself. Number 13, a habit of caution in reasoning. So this is just your basic critical thinking. This is just not jumping to conclusions. And the thing that I've found is like, you can have somebody who's pretty good at doing this within their professional domain, but then in any other area of their life, they, they're not critical thinking, cr critical thinkers. They don't apply, they don't generalize it. So I think that's a key thing is to generalize your critical thinking and just just really think, you know, well, what if that isn't true? You know, are there holes in that argument? Are there linkages that are missing here? And uh, I'm gonna be talking about this more in my communications course, my premium communication course down the road, but check out my, uh, it's in my membership site, um, Business the Hard Way Sales, Sales the Hard Way. That course takes you through uh, basically dialogue mapping or argument mapping and how to build a tree diagram of an argument and understand it and use that for your critical thinking. So that's huge. And then finally, 14, constant development and testing of prior judgments. You make judgments, you discriminate value, then you follow up and keep an eye on your predictions to see how far skewed or how consistent your predictions were. So this is basically the scientific method in a nutshell. You're making judgments, that's observation. Discriminating value, that's observation. That's basically measurement. And then you make predictions and you see how accurate they were. 
So it's obviously aligning a few things like having a theory and having a, you know, prediction is another word for hypothesis. But what's kind of missing here is that if you have a theory, you then need to somehow figure out a way to make it testable. And you also need to make a connection between the theory and whatever the observations are. And that's not, that's not an obvious thing. It's not even necessarily a rational thing. So that's getting into philosophy of science. I talk about this somewhat in my mental models course. Um, that's one of my premium courses. Um, and I'm gonna be doing more on this, kind of really understanding the scientific method But yeah, it's, you know, part of this is just not getting stuck into like, oh, I believe that this or that thing is true. And then I never question it or I never put it to the test. And part of learning is about saying, okay, I can get to a, like your first stage or two of learning in terms of like learning projects and lifelong learning and multi-year, multi-decade learning is it takes maybe a few months to a few years to learn all the different theories within an area, within a subject domain. That, but eventually you have to get to the point where you're thinking, okay, well, now I actually want to do something with this knowledge. What do each of these, how do each of these theories explain the current situation I'm in? And what do they tell me to do? What predictions do they make? How do they allow me to control the situation in some way or achieve something? And then they make some kind of prediction and then basically whatever you go out and do in the world, that's based on the theory, that's based on the hypothesis and the prediction that you put together. Whatever you're deciding to do, you frame that in terms of this is a testable hypothesis. This is how I'm gonna test the hypothesis and the theory. And sometimes you come up with the wrong experiment and you think you're disproving uh, the theory, but you're actually not. You just, there was a mistake somewhere else. There was a mistake in your measurement or there was a mistake in how you mapped the theory onto reality. So that, but that's getting to philosophy of science and the scientific method. But so these are the 14 um, principles. And this is what he found were the unique aspects of what's taught at these elite private schools the kind of private schools that future presidents come from, for example, and business leaders, and where the wealthiest and most powerful people send their kids. So these are the kind of things they're learning. And this is part of, you know, if you watch my other video on John, he's really critiquing this Prussian school system that was brought to the US and was used to like pump out good obedient soldiers and bureaucrats and factory workers. And so that works for the lower class and that kind of works for the middle class, but it doesn't work to create high quality leaders. And so that's where you wanna have this more upper class education that prepares the future leaders, the future decision makers of the society. And so they need to get this kind of education based on these kind of principles. So that's why these are so important. And I'll leave it there. So if you have any questions or comments, leave them down below. If you want more stuff like this, let me know. If there's other things you want me to react to, let me know down in the comments. Uh, make sure to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.